Hi, I'm Jonathan Megan. Thank you so much for coming to B-Sides Philadelphia, and thank you so much for coming to my talk. Uh, today we're going to talk about SPINDLE, the security policy notation and description language. Uh, so this is sort of us bringing SPINDLE to the world. Uh, I'm super grateful that you were able to come, and uh, let's get started. Uh, in case you were wondering who I am, I am a principal. I'm a computer scientist at Cigna, uh, or rather at a large healthcare company that rhymes with Cigna. Um, I work on a little team called Team T. T stands for Technology Empowerment and Advancement, which is like a super corporate little joke. Our logo is the teapot. You can see I've got my, my team shirt on here. Uh, I've been at Cigna for about uh, six years, coming up on my sixth Cignaversary. I did about five years in startups before that. Before that, I was in the public sector. And I'm really fascinated by security as a computer science problem. I think that there's a lot there. I'm really very excited to talk to you today um, and share some of the research that we've been doing uh, over the past few years. So the premise of this talk is something that I think most of us would agree on, which is that for a lot of companies and a lot of organizations in general, Application security reviews are really hard. They're really very hard. Everyone seems to struggle. You talk to someone and you hear about humans needing to balance safety with delivery pressures. You hear how labor intensive and error prone things are. You hear about how the process itself might not be ideal because it's after the fact. It's sometimes even too late to institute design changes, right? Uh, you know, cue that meme with the, I checked all the boxes, we're finally secure, right? It's hard. So let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a company. And this company emphasized security process over security practice. And that doesn't mean, when I say that, that doesn't mean that paperwork supplanted people actually rolling out controls. It just means that some people focused on the process more heavily than the practice. And as the company fixed this problem, an imbalance reared its head. And this imbalance was significant. Security reviews are always going to exceed the number of available humans required to perform them. And that can be expressed with an inequality, specifically that S, the number of security reviews, will always be greater than H, the number of humans available to, to, to perform them. And that's pretty significant. If there will always be a backlog, then there will always be pressure to hurry. And if there's always pressure to hurry, that's how mistakes get made in an already error-prone process. Nothing can be completely perfect, but trying to get it as good as we can is something that's really important. Around this time, a frustrated practitioner and a security specialist partnered to look through available research. Academic and industrial research didn't have too much to offer. There were things like OpenSCAP, which came out around that time, but truth be told, there wasn't much there. So we sort of started to wonder. I mean, they sort of started to wonder, could automation have an answer? And this is where things got very interesting. The pair were unable to find any real prior art that covered all their bases, and so they built something themselves. Quite obviously, the practitioner was me, and the security specialist was actually my colleague, uh, spelled it wrong, and my friend, Baird Keiki, that is spelled right. Uh, Baird is a wonderful, wonderful security uh, uh, individual, great guy. And we set out some goals for this project. Transparency and consistency for all, there should be one set of clear rules for everyone. Continuous enforcement and compliance, security must be carried from design, past review, through implementation, and user ergonomics. We wanna build stuff that we wanna use. And so we made Spindle, the security policy notation and description language. Spindle is a domain specific language or a DSL for specifying security policies and an ecosystem of tools for working with them. So we're gonna break this down because that says a lot. All right, so let's go over it one more time. Spindle is a domain specific language, a DSL, for specifying security policies and an ecosystem of tools for working with them. So we said that Spindle is a domain-specific language, a DSL. So what's a DSL? Well, it's a computer language of limited generality, useful for solving problems within a specific domain. 
And this is adapted from Martin Fowler's definition. The point is, is that you wanna move your tool closer to your problem so that you can solve it better. So what is a DSL in real life? Ordering coffee, all right? Ordering coffee. I'll have a grande double shot non-fat caramel macchiato with soy into Splenda. Um, I don't know what I just said, but is it of limited generality? Yes, it is. We don't speak like that in regular conversations. Is it useful only within a spe specific domain to solve a particular problem? Yes, that's right. Is it a computer language? No. So technically it doesn't fit the definition completely, but two out of three ain't bad. For specifying security policies, it's a DSL for specifying security policies. Well, how do you model a security policy? Simple. Make the design a property graph. So you make the security design that you are describing a property graph. What's a property graph? So it's a graph, which is a mathematical structure, G, which consists of a set of two sets. So you have V, the set of vertices or nodes. You have E, which is the set of all edges or connections between them. And that graph, that structure is labeled with arbitrary properties, usually key value pairs. So think of a network structure that's annotated with data. A network structure that's annotated with data. The properties on the graph make it a property graph. The network structure is the graph itself. And it's an ecosystem of tools for working with those policies. And this is where it gets really interesting, okay? So I'm very excited to, to, to show you this. Tools in the Spindle ecosystem, uh, there were four main components. There was Spaceship, which was a policy authorship DSL for writing policies. Speed Racer was a policy visualizer. Spot was an automated policy checker. And Spider was a compliance robot, all right? With Spindle, you could write a policy with Spaceship syntax, visual, visualize the diagram with Speed Racer, check that policy with Spot, and then monitor your implementation with Spider. So you write the policy, you visualize it, you check it, and then you monitor, right? So let's go through these one by one because there's a lot here. One, write a policy with spaceship syntax. The syntax is a subset of Elixir syntax. Elixir is a programming language. Um, it's usually used for uh, pretty high reliability, high availability software because of, the, of its lineage where it comes from. Um, it used this wonderful function in the code module called string to quoted that parsed code to an abstract syntax tree. And then you could serialize that to a JSON graph, so compilation. And the reason that we chose Elixir syntax was because if you create a new DSL from scratch with new syntax, then no editors support it. But almost every editor out there, VS Code, Emacs even, even Vim, uh, they all have modes for Elixir already, so we sort of got a lot for free there. This was the original spaceship syntax, which is non-Elixir. Uh, you can see that there was a policy declaration, you know, description, whatever, author, Baird, author, Jonathan, you know, system, microser microservice A maybe, a host name, a kind, sort of all different kinds of metadata. Um, it was okay, right? was okay. Um, the problems with the first conception of the domain-specific language were that an externally hosted syntax requires a custom parser. And when parsing this particular language, there are certain linguistic ambiguities that we ran into. And also from an ergonomics perspective, there were lots of special characters or sequences and lots of familiar characters or sequences that were used in unfamiliar ways. So this was kind of tough, all right? The second generation Elixir syntax, which was much less typing, used, uh, well, it looked like this. So take a second and study it. You can see that there's a policy with a title. It has a description, it has a list of authors, it has a system just like everything else, except it's a little bit more readable and a little bit more familiar. Perhaps the biggest change is really the equal sign, uh, which is less typing than two characters, the arrow. You can see the connects two declarations on the last two lines of the system stanza. So the takeaway is that the string to quoted function in the code module of Elixir is money, all right? Why is it so great? Because it takes Elixir syntax and parses it to an abstract syntax tree, which provides excellent syntax errors, okay? So if there's a problem, if there's a mistake, if you have an illegal piece of syntax, 
the string to quoted function will actually spit out that error for you. That AST, that abstract syntax tree, can then be transformed to other structures, which is how we compiled it to a JSON document. And it doesn't interpret or execute code at all. So you don't run into possibilities of trouble like you do with uh, a proper Turing complete language. It just parses the syntax um, and then gives you the tree. It doesn't actually interpret anything or execute anything. Next, you could visualize a diagram with Speed Racer. So once you had this compiled JSON policy, you could actually convert it either to dot, which could be uh, visualized with the venerable GraphViz toolkit, or it could be displayed interactively in, in a browser. And that was really important for us. We wanted both printable and web quality diagrams, but what we also wanted was we wanted the ability to play with the diagram and move nodes around and say, okay, well, what if we move this system here? And what if we took this piece and we stretched it out and put this in between, how would that change our design? So that interactivity was really key for us. This is what a early version of it looked like. Um, you can see their sort of microservice A, B, and C with ridiculous host names and their servers and they're running an old version of Red Hat and they're connecting over HTTP. It's, a, I mean, all kinds of stuff, right? This was rendered using GraphViz from an actual totally bogus, but policy. Three, you can check the policy with spot. So when spot does a policy, spot check, get it, spot, spot, you, you feel it? Any, any, all right, okay. Um, it does a three layer analysis. So the first one is it's a structural or a schematic analysis. The second one is a rule-based analysis. And the third one is a graph analysis. So the, for the structural or the schematic analysis, it would answer questions like, is the policy well formed? Is any crucial information missing? Can this policy pass audit? Do we have everything we need? That sort of stuff. For the rule-based analysis, did you violate any of the never should I evers? Good question, right? Uh, we sort of took the rules that we wanted to implement and made sure that the policy passed all of them. Does the policy's basic structure comply with standards, right? Those kinds of questions. But for the graph analysis, we were able to get really, really, really interesting. What choke points are there in this network, in the security design? Can we identify any unprotected paths which could be threat vectors? And we got pathfinding algorithms for graphs that have been around for a long time. A star, Dijkstra's algorithm, the Bellman Ford algorithm, stuff like that. So by picking a graph and modeling things as a graph, we got a lot of different algorithms for free, more or less out of the box. And because of that, there were no surprises. Everybody knows the rules. Teams know the rules. Reviewers know the rules. Auditors know the rules. Automation knows the rules. Everyone uses Spot. No surprises. When you are seeing how your security review is going to be viewed by others, they have the same tools that you do, and you have the same tools that they do. And that consistency was key. Four, monitor your implementation with Spider. Spider robots. A compliance robot, which continuously checks your infrastructure against your policy, is a cool concept and one of the most interesting things that we did with the whole Spindle ecosystem. This spider bot was awesome. If Spindle is an OS, right, if it's an operating system, which is at its core a, research, a resource manager, then spider is the kernel, the beating heart. Right? It's actually inspired by microkernel and nanokernel architectures. We called it the Spock architecture, the security process orchestration and compliance kernel, because when you work at a big company, you have to have acronyms. So we called it the Spock architecture. The Spock architecture is like an OS. It has a scheduler, it has drivers, it has connectivity services, system information aggregation, all the things that you would want and appreciate. The scheduler operates on a preemptive deadline-free tick system, which is a fancy way of saying that it kicks off, it does its thing, sleeps for a little bit, and then kicks off again. And drivers are modular security profiles. Those are what actually communicated with systems, and they can be composed and layered in to add functionality piecewise. So as an example, if a policy specifies that a JVM is connecting to MySQL using TLS, then Spider would say, oh, there's JVM here. We're going to lay in the job. We're going to layer in the Java profile. There's MySQL. We're going to layer in the MySQL database profile. And then TLS. We're going to make sure that that TLS 
uh, connection is okay, right? So it would layer in these functionalities, uh, sort of making sure that the baseline covered the technologies that were present. And connectivity services. It had agentless operation to components, uh, anything in your system, as long as it could be connected to via SSH or WinRM. Um, there were no remote requirements other than a user account, which could be unprivileged. We used a, for the time, customized version of InSpec by Chef. Um, well, the policies were customized. We didn't actually touch InSpec itself. Um, the Chef folks have done a really cool thing with InSpec. I strongly recommend that this, if policy and infrastructure and compliance as code is interesting to you, check out InSpec. I'd love to hear what you think about it. And also system information aggregation. It would log to the SEM. We would have metrics go to dashboards via uh, uh, Prometheus metrics, a whole bunch of stuff. Really interesting. So this is sort of what the architecture looked like. There are four boxes inside a big box. So you had system information aggregation, connectivity services, drivers, and a scheduler. Kind of like an operating system. The workflow behind Spider was really interesting. And the workflow behind the whole Spindle ecosystem was even more interesting. So you would write your policy, you would visualize it, you would check it, and then you could enforce it. You would use Spaceship to Speed Racer, to Spot, to Spider. And this workflow is really cyclic. I know it's, it's linear on these slides, but it's really cyclic because the policy will evolve as the product changes and grows. So as you iterate on the product, you're also iterating on the policy that supports it as well. Um, and that's a really key piece, right? So when the policy lives with the code, not in some, I don't know, other repository full of diagrams and a bunch of stuff, they can actually grow in tandem. So anytime that you needed to uh, give additional privilege or permissions to the product, you would modify the policy accordingly. So they would grow in tandem, right? And that's really important because when you have your security policies separate from your code, I mean, diagrams or whatever, if, you know, let's say you were under attack by a threat actor, you would not pick up the red phone and go quickly get the diagrams. Diagrams don't keep you safe, right? But when you have your policy that lives with the code, at least they stay in sync, right? We call that co-nascence or uh, connaissance, some people call it, but it's really, they are co-nascent. Uh, so we built all this cool stuff. We had a lot of fun. And we tested it with users and systems. We had a lot of fun. And we learned a lot. <laughs> I mean, a lot, right? There were some things that went really well. End users loved writing code instead of filling out forms. Teams loved it because they could always consult the policy files. They were sitting right there. And reviewers loved it because they could work more efficiently. And that is to say that automation is really great. Automation is great, but augmentation is better than automation. And for us, this was key because it preserved the role of human judgment and centered the role of human judgment, preserving this ability, and it really, it's really enabled these people who were stuck doing paperwork to use their security expertise and their knowledge and ask the hard questions, work directly with teams, right? Really elevate the level of practice, preserve that role, but at the same time, it freed them from toil, which is a really important thing. We called that at the time, continuous compliance. That's not a term we made up, but that's what we adopted. And if we had to do over again, we would do things differently. One, we would have static types, right? We would have a static type checker, which, which would have type inference for the DSL. And we think that that would yield better tool support and errors in advance. Maybe we couldn't use Elixir anymore. Don't know, but we think Elixir is the right way to go. We think that we would leverage Elixir even more. So we, were, we would write as much as possible in pure Elixir, largely because one language heterogeneity is really hard, right? When you, we had a little bit of Ruby, a little bit of Elixir, a little bit of Shell, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Okay, enough already, right? One language would have helped us. And also Elixir and OTP, they're really resilient. It takes a licking and keeps on ticking. And that matters when it's 3 a.m. and there's a problem. 
It would also leverage existing technologies, some of which which didn't some of which didn't even exist back then, right? So today we could use Kubernetes to run workloads, right? Primarily because no one wants to write a distributed scheduler, <laughs> right? Um, which isn't to say Kubernetes is that great, right? I mean, it has some things it does really well. It has some things that maybe not so well, but we would probably use that to run workloads. We would also want to leverage CICD a little bit more by integrating better and more tightly with CICD processes, probably so that we could validate policies and deployments, maybe even on every change. And for us, that would look like, yes, you check the policy on every change, but you could also ask Spider for ad hoc enforcement to determine if the new deployments match the latest version of the policy. If they don't, break the build, trigger a rollback, right? And the last action in a successful pipeline would be to submit the policy to Spider for continuous compliance and monitoring. So a great example of what we're talking about would be blue-green deployments, right? You have two copies of your infrastructure, your blue and your green. You deploy, you're serving from your blue, you deploy to your green, and then you gradually move over. And if anything goes, goes wrong, you go back, but you can't switch colors without Spider's okay. So if you're serving from blue and your new policy covers what's in green, if what's in green doesn't match the policy, right, can't switch colors. So we could also integrate better with external systems. Now we have things like the open telemetry standard for community, oh, whoa. Now we have things like the open telemetry standard for communicating results. And that's in order, we would use that to make the results of Spider more digestible, specifically by other systems. We'd also make much better use of available APIs. There's now so much more than SSH and WinRM for running remote commands. You could inspect containers running on orchestration platforms like uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. You could use cloud management APIs for AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Platform, check out an S3 bucket or a database monitor, a serverless function, whatever it is. We could look at things in much greater depth than simply connecting to them and running some commands. We'd also want to align spindle, Spindle's goals to organization-specific compliance and security requirements. Cigna's a big company. We would want to make sure that we're covering our bases with this and help and let it help us with our SOX obligations, our HIPAA uh, uh, regulatory burden, um, PCI DSS, all those kinds of things. And we would probably want to use frameworks like NIST to help us categorize our controls. Again. We learned a lot. We really did. This brings us to another question. What's next for Spindle? So in 2017, we shared the Spindle project at the Cigna Technical Conference when it was just an early, early, early research project. It was awesome. We got some really great feedback. A lot of, hey, did you think about this? And we were like, no, we didn't, but we should. And a lot of, I see a little problem. If you're going to do this and that, you got to do... Wow, okay, so that helped us to develop the idea and the project even more. This talk, however, at B-Sides Philadelphia 4, is the first step in sharing more broadly. It's the first step. We need to start a conversation in this industry, right? Security reviews are always going to outpace the humans available to perform them. S is greater than H all the time, that inequality isn't going away. We need to start a conversation about technology solutions to security problems. We need to make sure that we're centering and preserving the role of human judgment, emphasizing it even more. We should be talking about bringing, bringing cutting edge computer science into the discussion, research, technique, the experimental mindset. It's important. We're learning more about what it actually means to shift left, what defense in depth means when you look at it as a continuous practice and not just a one-time design decision. We wanna make it so that it's easy to be secure by design everywhere and verify, uh, especially IoT though. Uh, that's really important because when your toaster is a threat vector, you have, you have two problems. So we also think that we should be looking at developments that have come out in recent years. Uh, I just learned about recently the Katala language, which is a domain specific language for specifying legal documents. Um, one of the hard things about DSL design is that 
the problem is at the intersection, the junction of the people piece and the technology piece. So the socio-technical aspect is really interesting. So I study DSLs that come out. The Catala language for legal documents, um, my wonderful wife who supports me in all things is a lawyer. So uh, that would be pretty cool if I could show her that. Um, there's also the lean theorem prover, which if you get this joke, it's funny. It's a better Coke than Coke. Um, you can see the Xena project. The lean theorem prover is really interesting. The Xena project is an international effort organized by some folks out of the UK to formalize and prove the foundations of mathematics and make it available as a library. That would mean that we could have some really exciting um, abilities to statically analyze a security policy to make sure that it's internally consistent. I think that there's something out there that has to do with an SAT solver, maybe a Boolean satisfaction or constraint solving, but there, there's a lot out there. I think that's really cool. There's the COCA language. Uh, both Lean and COCA happen to be from Microsoft. Um, COCA is a programming language with first class effects. I think that that would be really cool for learning about um, how, for being able to model how components interact with one another. I think there's something else there. And, you know, please reach out because we love this stuff. And there's a lot that we haven't thought of, but we'd like to hear from you about what you've thought of. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, I should also say you can follow Cigna on Twitter. Um, I'm super grateful to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here for accepting my goofy CFP uh, or my CFP application. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you for, for watching. I can't tell you how much it means to me.